Welcome. It is another edition of InfoWars Nightly News, Valentine's Day edition here on this February 14th, 2012 edition. An investigative journalist with the BBC, Greg Pallast, Vultures Picnic, best-selling author, is going to be joining us with some bombshell info concerning the EU uh, designed implosion. The latest on the News Corps scandal, will Rupert Murdoch be indicted and arrested here in the United States? by a Justice Department caught shipping guns into Mexico and narcotics back into the U.S. That's like Satan calling one of his demons evil. And we'll be exploring that with him, as well as Al-Qaeda forces working openly for the U.S., Israel, and NATO, as well as England, I should add. It's all coming up with Greg Palace after the news. But first, the news. We had yesterday on the radio uh, award-winning director, TV host, uh, former head of the Screen Actors Guild, movie star, Ed Asner, who's a very credible individual. You may not agree with his politics sometimes. Nobody agrees with everything. But he is a guy that doesn't make stuff up. In fact, I've been so busy, I'm supposed to call the Navy SEALs today. I got the number uh, last night. Uh, he even gave me the names and numbers of the, of the uh, folks. Uh, and uh, some of them are current. Some of them are former Navy SEALs that I myself have also been talking to. Uh, who question what happened, uh, of course, with the death of the SEALs that were part of the fake bin Laden raid being packed on that helicopter and blown up. Uh, but his Navy SEAL sources, um, again, that we're getting in contact with, told him that a false flag event, internationally but also domestically possibly, to be blamed on Iran to get us into this new war is imminent. And when you have the main national security advisor, as we covered last week, Mr. Clapper, openly writing for the Brookings Institute that a provocation, a stage provocation is needed, kind of like when the neocons wrote the PNAC documents saying a new 9-11, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor type event was needed. It's very, very uh, creepy. Uh, Asner said it is up to the American people to recognize and prevent an imminent false flag operation and stop another disastrous war before it gets started. He said the Navy SEALs are now coming forward because they are worried that an Iran false flag attack runs the danger of creating a worldwide conflict if it gets out of hand. And it's been the military for the last five years that continues to stop this war with Iran that Russia and China say they're going to get involved in. And don't forget, Pulitzer Prize winner Cy Hirsch came out five years ago. Well, he came out four years ago, right when Cheney was leaving office, and said that a year before, so a total of five years ago, that, uh, and then this is teleprompter free, so I'm always going from memory here. You can look it up for yourself. It's not like the info babe or whatever, just all slickly reading off a teleprompter. This is real data. Uh, he wrote in New Yorker magazine and gave a speech at a, at a university, Cy Hirsch did, saying that his White House sources told him Dick Cheney tried to order the SEALs in the Navy to paint up U.S. ships like Iranian patrol boats and have them attack destroyers. But Admiral Fox Fallon, we now know, said no to that. And Admiral Mullen, uh, the former uh, head of CENTCOM, uh, and then later the head of... Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff itself went to Israel a few years ago and told them, don't stage a USS Liberty like you did attacking our ship to get us into a new war. So there's some background and some history on that huge story that's up at Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. Continuing, uh, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting uh, has the headline, Do TV Networks Practice for War? I remember seeing a documentary a decade ago about... 20 years ago, uh, when they launched the first Gulf War, when CBS and ABC, and it had all the clips in the documentary that I saw on PBS that aired a decade after the Gulf War, where they were drilling and preparing and, and had Dan Rather and others scripting and rehearsing uh, how they would uh, cover the news once the war was started, and they were working with the Pentagon. And so Alexander Cockburn um, in Counterpunch reports that he was visiting ABC News the other day to see a friend who works in graphics. When I went to his room, he showed me all the graphics he was working on in anticipation of Israeli attack on Iran. Not just maps, but uh, flight patterns, trajectories of 3D models, U.S. aircraft carrier fleets, and more. And it just goes through all of that. So yes, it's all highly, highly scripted. Uh, continuing, I saw a report a few days ago where the high court in England has ruled 
uh, that one of the heads of the global Rothschild family that's very secretive about their wealth, but it's estimated to be around 300 trillion leveraged of uh, different uh, derivatives and things they've sold the world population. 300 trillion, you heard me right. Uh, when you hear about Bill Gates being the richest guy, give me a break, he's nothing. Uh, I've seen Financial Times of London articles years ago that whenever they bust a Russian oligarch, and he's supposedly worth 20 billion bucks or whatever, they find out he's a total front owning nothing, and you guessed it, works for the Rothschilds. So this is nothing new. This has been in major British papers. But when the uh, Mail Online and the Daily Mail newspaper did a report on the fact that um, this particular Rothschild was hanging out with Lord Mandelson uh, and the EU Trade Commissioner and was taking them around the world, getting them sweetheart deals so that he would reportedly get sweetheart deals for himself, uh, he, he sued the Daily Mail for saying that he was, quote, a puppet master. I mean, the Rothschilds are the definition of puppet masters, and they've gotten really good about hiding their wealth in the last hundred years. They were a little more conspicuous before that, and that's why they own more palaces and real estate than all of the world's royalty combined. And, uh, you can go even look on Wikipedia, and it just shows one branch of the family has over a hundred giant palaces, okay? And, and, and that's just the palaces. They own it all, because they have always been able to loan out money that they create out of nothing and leverage a dollar you deposit 10 times. Now they just sell derivatives. But the point is, he sued them over it, saying, I don't puppet master, I don't run anything. I'm not going to Russia and meeting with these people. Well, now the high court has come out and ruled against him because it, all these photos and things came out of him at meetings at the very facilities that they said he'd been at with Lord Mandelson and others. And here's a quote from the ruling. So far as Lord Mandelson was concerned, the benefit was the trip and the hospitality itself. So far as uh, Mr. Derspiska was concerned, it was a relationship with the EU Trade Commissioner, a businessman with such extensive and global interest as he would be likely to welcome an opportunity to get to know a person in Lord Mandelson's position. The judge said Mr. Rothschild's Different and developing accounts of the purpose of the visit to the plants in Siberia were confusing and the banker had not been entirely candid. I mean, come on. You're not a puppet master when you've got all these trade commissioners under you and you're flying around with them? And, and it's well known the Rothschilds control every oligarch that's been busted so far? So there's still a few courts that are not completely corrupt. That's what this shows. But again, England has some of the most strict libel laws in the world. So that's why he sued him in England. Uh, but there's that report. Defeat of Mandelson's billionaire as judge backs the mail over story of Rothschild and the Russian oligarch. So there you have that report. Continuing here, as you know, Fukushima has had five major meltdowns, huge explosions, makes Chernobyl look uh, tame in comparison. And all over, not just the United States, but Europe, because we're in the Northern Hemisphere, and the trade winds and jet stream goes from Japan over towards the east. I know you think of Japan. I think of Japan as east. But it goes from Japan east over the Pacific, over North America, over the Atlantic, over Europe, over the Middle East, Central Asia, and then right back over Japan it's a globe, goes in circles. And so that stuff is just coming over, coming over, coming over. And so different isotopes have gone up a couple hundred percent, a couple thousand percent. EPA just raised some of the isotope levels that are safe 100,000 times what they were. You can look it up. We've shown you the numbers. EPA's proud of it. They say radiation is no longer an issue. TSA now says because of the new radiation uh, rules being increased that it's fine. They lied and said there wasn't radiation, but now they say, well, they just said it's safe. So there is radiation, but it's good for you. I'm glad the bureaucrats can wave magic wands. Just, I, I didn't think abracadabra worked like, I'm a trendy bureaucrat, eugenicist, ah, radiation good. And you just go, mmm, and then it's just, <laughs> no problem. But you've got to do the trendy face. Mmm, trendy. And as long as GMO sterilizing all the mice they feed it to, it's all right for us, trendy. Carbon dioxide evil, radiation good, trendy. <laughs> That's enough, Gary. Another Team America quote. We need an actor, Gary. 
Sorry, what were you saying, Marcos? Exactly, we need an actor, Gary. But again, the bureaucrats say it's fine, and Mombiot and all these big globalists, world government eugenicists have said they're for radiation. He said, Fukushima has made me believe in radiation. In fact, people won't believe it. London Guardian, George Mombiot, top globalist uh, minion pusher, pimp, um, saying, Fukushima has made me believe in nuclear power. It's like you eat something and you die, then they, they say, oh, it's good for you. But, but here's the news. Fukushima reactor temperature surpasses 752 degrees, more than four times maximum for cold shutdown. But uh, 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 I don't want to hear about science. They told me months ago everything's handled there. All you've got to do is, again, wave the trendy wand. Ugh, trendy. And then it handles everything. In other words, the thermometer is showing temperatures more than four times higher than 100 degrees Celsius limit for cold shutdown. TEPCO claims that such high reading means the thermometer must be broken, even though there's smoke seen coming out of it. They claimed all those big explosions were no big deal and hadn't breached the containment. Of course, it, they got caught lying about that as well. But again, doesn't matter because the Japanese government's got what our government's got. They're telling schools nearby, stay open, even though the kids and people are falling down dead and dying. Oh, there's deaths. They just go, don't worry. Don't worry about the fact you're dead. Uh, trendy. That's all you got to do. It's like a little magic wand. Uh, you just like, imagine the power. It's like Harry Potter's real. I mean, as long as you're a government, well, oh, I insulted Harry Potter. The pen broke. See, I made fun of a trendy wand. Ah, oh, not trendy. Ah. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the radiation's raining down on us. In 86, for at least six months, no food grown in Europe could be eaten, no milk, nothing because of radiation. They just said, nope, ship it in. Especially kids with fast-growing cells. You know, kids get affected more by radiation, don't eat it. And now they just go, oh, trendy. I'm sorry. You know, my wand is not powerful enough. I talked about about Harry Potter. You saw what happened. Watch this. Yeah. <laughs> in 3D. Listen, if I was a government bureaucrat, they're like wizards. I could just go, I can fly, I'm government, uh, and just like fly to the moon. You could have spaceships with like windows in them, not, not even portals. You don't even need oxygen. It's just like, radiation's good, world government, uh, trendiness. All right, all right. You guys should not laugh at my jokes or I'll do it more. Oh, God. <sighs> I already taped the interview with uh, Palast earlier. It's a powerful interview, and I really covered some key stuff at the very end of the show in an extended comment after he was on with us. Um, the truth is the bizarroness of them saying high levels of radiation are safe for us gets me very angry, and it's affecting all of us. And I'm still sitting here being bathed in radiation, not moving to the Southern Hemisphere. So I guess I'm part of it. I just, I just think I can wave a trendy wand and everything's fine. What would be the name? What is the name of Harry Potter's wand? Google that. Is it Tallywhacker? There it is. Oh my God, a Hogwart. It's called a Voltmert, Harry, Hermaphrodite, and a Ron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my God, think of the power I'd have with one of those. <laughs> that, that must be what the EPA has. They've just got a little Hogwart warrant wand, better than my big pen. I mean, look at these big pens. You get like 20 of them for a dollar, but you see why. They got little microchips in them so Harry Potter can control them. All right, that's enough. It's Valentine's Day. My wife's waiting on me. Oh, but everything's fine. Makers of genetically, let's move on from the radiation to something more nutritious and more wholesome. There we go. Makers of genetically modified seeds say more farmers evading EPA rules. Because, see, you're supposed to plant some corn that the bugs and animals can eat, or they'll all die if they only eat the poison corn. And then they say that <laughs> then they get used to the poison corn that grows its own pesticide that, that we eat. Again, just hiding in plain void. Uh, this is a pharmacological crop. It grows a poison at 1,000 times what's naturally there. There is a fungus that naturally grows at 1,000% or lower 
one th you know one percent to a thousand percent more that that, that that it grows after modification and bugs won't eat it so monsanto makes it the guys that gave you agent orange and hell everybody knows that's good for you that's better for you than orange juice or tang i mean i'm not a conspiracy theorist i just told you radiation's good for you well agent orange is even better i mean it'll make your kid look like a flounder but you know whatever just go ahead and do it continuing here um because i'm not a conspiracy theorist i'm not going to question Hey, you, you make a pesticide naturally grow 1,000 times stronger than it's supposed to in corn? That sounds really good. Of course, they feed it to the rats and it sterilizes them and gives them cancer, but I mean, hell, what's wrong with that? I mean, you know, sorry. Maybe the EPA, well, I guess they already have had said that it's safe. 1,000 times the poison level, good for you. Uh, the rules affect farmers planting seeds modified to produce a toxin. That's a poison derived from Bacillus thrungineus or BT, a natural insecticide. It's natural. It's good. Uh, of course, a uh, iron hammer is natural. I beat your head in with it. The Environmental Protection Agency requires those growers to also plant an adjacent area, a so-called refuge, so the so the bugs can run from the stuff that kills them that we eat. <laughs> You got to plant another field for the for the honeybees and the grasshoppers so they don't all die. You're not planting the refuges. This stuff's only meant to kill people. We're eugenicist Nazis. But the bugs, you're killing them too. Listen, you got to plant separate equal corn for them to eat cuz cuz most of them will smell it and won't eat it. Pigs won't eat this stuff on record. Uh, uh, insects won't eat it unless they're starving. So you got to plant something normal for them. You're killing all the bugs. And you're not planning it. This is meant to kill your ass, not them. I'm a trendy environmentalist. You're supposed to die, you and your kids, not the bugs. Sorry, I'm just hidden in plain view article. Seems to get to me a little bit here, you know? Oh, let me go back to the article. Oh, honey, let me sit down. I'm a real trendy, you know, reading the Washington Post, let's say in D.C. I'm sitting back. Oh, how dare those farmers not planting a refuge from the corn we eat. Oh, let me see this here. Oh, let me have my coffee, dear. And some more of that GMO corn. I've got to go to the doctor. You know, I've got that liver cancer. <laughs> uh, I mean, hold on. That's what it gives you. Makers of genetically modified seeds say more farmers evading EPA rules. Damn them. EPA tries to protect us and only have the humans eat the poisoned corn. I mean, what's wrong with them? Let me continue here. Honey, get me some eggs over here. Preferably not farm raised. Don't, hold on. The rules affect farmers planting seeds modified to produce a toxin derived from the bacteria, or BT, a natural insecticide. Oh, thank God it's natural. Kind of like that nightshade, if you eat one leaf of it, it'll make you die in five minutes. That's natural, too. The Environmental Protection Agency requires those growers to also plant a adjunct area, an adjacent area, with a so-called refuge of the non-BT corn so that bugs feed on both types of corn and don't become immune to the toxin that's meant to kill them. Well, I'm not supposed to notice what that is saying hidden in plain view, that the corn I eat kills bugs, but I mean, again, everybody knows. You go to the store, there's a can of Raid. That's bad for a bug, but not for you. For you, it's a salad dressing. You just go and you get the, get the, you get the Raid. You just spray it on the or maybe maybe a steak flavor. Oh, honey. Oh, my God, there's some termite poison. Let's braise the steak in that and marinate it. Honey, I found a new thing. Bug poison and red wine on the meat. Maybe some short ribs and raid poison. <laughs> see, when you're crazy like me, crazy like Alex Jones, you actually see this stuff. You actually, oh, it's good. <laughs> oh, my God, that's, it's raid. It's what's for dinner. Raid the other white meat. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, we're having some breakthroughs here tonight. We've learned I'm an extremist. And I think, hey, if the corn's killing bugs, what's the problem? Obviously, that's not going to affect me. Because, like we all know, eat some decon rad poison, you're fine. You'll die, but you're fine. In fact, I heard the EPA, just like with radiation, is going to say death. They're going to wave a little wand, a little trendy wand, a little mm -mm -mm, and then it's like ho hocus pocus pocus abracadabra, and just no more problem. Okay, I'm going to stop flipping out here. Do you realize how insane all this is in your face? 
But Bill Gates owns Monsanto now. He's a good person. <laughs> he talks about he wants to reduce the population all day, but hey, we're bugs to them, you know, bug poison. Have a little chemotherapy corn. I mean, you know, maybe it'll help you actually. Because bug poison that's chemotherapy, they say is good too. See, I'm learning. TSA forces woman to use naked body scanner three times because they told her she was cute. Oh, and they've been caught and had to settle cases where they try to pick up women and tell them they've got nice uh, mammary glands, nice um, Borden's factories. And it, 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 okay, now I've got to stop. This is out of control, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and it goes on here um, that uh, they, they had the third blast of radiation from the body scanner. The male TSA agents in the back room were obviously enjoying the show and tried to send her through yet a fourth time to see more images of her naked body. And uh, they went on to basically tell her that uh, she was a hottie. So uh, there's that information for you. But that's, that's what land of the free home of the brave is. You know, the radiation's good, bug poison corn is good, and your wife being grabbed and groped and naked scanned by radiation is nutritious. In fact, she should have paid them. Like, thank you for the nutritious radiation. It's, it's good for me. Not only the EPA saying that it's, it's not bad for you, maybe next it'll be good for you. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I got so fired up, even though it's not really hot in here. I got a cone head tonight. Look at that. <laughs> despite all of that, <laughs> despite all of that, I got a loving Rothschild quote, because you know what? They should have sued the Daily Mail. The Rothschilds don't pull any strings. They're not puppet masters. That was what the suit was over. They don't run nothing. Not even those hundreds of giant palaces and all the oil companies and media companies and all those secret subsidiaries they use and private islands. I just want to say thank you, Lord Rothschild. I want to thank you for all the radiation and bug poison corn. You're a very nice person. <laughs> all right. <laughs> We're going to go to break. Come on, folks. I apologize. The bug poison is good. I shouldn't even joke. Next, they're going to say raid is actually. They'll have some law kids at the snort raid in the first period class or something. Snort your nutrition. Eat your corn, it's good for you. It'll make you grow extra arms and legs. All right. <clears throat> yeah, within three generations, I'd always read in biology that you didn't have mutations like, you know, in the movies where people grow extra legs and eyeballs. But GMO in all the mammal species they tested on actually does that. You can look at the studies. So obviously it's good for you, and I'm a conspiracy theorist for not liking it. Please support Homeland Security, support the government, do whatever they say. Greg Palace is coming up. Stay with us. Oh, I have the quote. I have the quote. Oh, thank you. Teleprompter free. So I guess this is why they have teleprompter free news. Did you ever see that newscaster talk about the chicken? <laughs> Live on TV? Yeah, well, I'm not going to say it. Or Bill O'Reilly? He was really impressed that they hadn't given him the right liner on the teleprompter. He goes, I'll write it live. I'll do it. And they're like, no, sir, no one has ever been able to actually say something without a teleprompter. And he goes, I'll do it. Got 10 seconds. We're ready. One, two, I'll do it live. Shut up. I'll do it live. And that's a little bit of sting taking us out today from his new album. We'll see you back tomorrow night. Hi, I'm a friendly guy. Thanks a lot. And then he's like, for the show. Rah! I'm trendy. All right, I'm sorry. Bug boys and more of it. Anyways, um, let me give you a Baron Nathan Mayer Rothschild, loving individual. He said, I care not what puppet is placed on the throne of England to rule the empire. The man that controls Britain's money supply controls the British empire, and I control the money supply. And you know who owns most of the Federal Reserve? But don't talk about it or Nat Rothschild will come after you. You can't get my soul, punk. I know it's what you're after, but you failed. And no amount of bug poison corn is going to stop us. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We were brought up loving our country and our Constitution. That in the United States of America, we were free. And that's an attitude that we've tried to instill in our children. I met my wife well. Uh, in the Air Force. I was a combat pilot in Vietnam. I served in Desert Storm as a commander. When I graduated from the academy, I took the oath of office. Uh, and as a commander, I administered that oath to many people. 
now I, I wonder about the understanding people have of our Constitution, and I think about our candidates for President of the United States. Uh, it's interesting to see the support Ron Paul gets from the military. And if we think back to the code of conduct uh, and people raising their right hand that they were going to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, why would those same people support in great numbers Ron Paul? I think it's because they know that he supports the Constitution of the United States. It doesn't mean you have to go to war to do it. Uh, it means you have to understand what the Constitution is and be a supporter inside of your own country, whether you're in the military or not, of uh, that Constitution and make the United States strong. And Ron Paul does that. That's his feeling. That's his thrust. And that's why if you look at the percentages that support him and the military, it's huge. Why is that? Because they've raised their right hands and they're putting their lives on the line for us here in the United States. And they know that Ron Paul does the same. Greetings, fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here announcing the first of many trips that I'm going to take across this wonderful United States that we live in. And we get so busy here at InfoWars.com, the nightly news, the daily radio show, the documentary films, and all the other things we're doing that I tend to never go out and give speeches anymore. And I've got a lot of ideas bubbling around in my head about the history of the New World Order, what makes them tick and how to defeat them. So I'm titling this key speech I'm going to give. It'll run around two hours long, Blueprint to Defeat the New World Order. And we're also going to have a surprise premiere of a short documentary film we've been working on at the event. First off, I'm going to be going to Dallas, Texas, Sunday, February 19th, 2012, to the historic Lakewood Theater. And the next Sunday, February 26th, I'm going to be in Orlando, Florida. You can find out more about the events and buy tickets at InfoWars.com forward slash events. Now, unfortunately, every event I've ever had, we've had to turn people away. So get your tickets early at InfoWars.com forward slash events. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in this world. And the craziest of all is this explosive awakening. I can't wait to meet you and shake your hand. I'll see you in Dallas and I'll see you in Orlando. InfoWars.com forward slash events. And we are back with this February 14th, Valentine's Day episode of InfoWars Nightly News with award-winning documentary filmmaker, best-selling author, BBC News investigative reporter, ABC News investigative reporter, Greg Pallast. And I got to tell you, I read his book recently. I got it a few months ago, didn't have time to read it. It is, I think, his best. It's Vulture's Picnic in Pursuit of Petroleum, Pigs, Power, Pirates, and High Finance Carnivores. And I wanted to get him on uh, to get the inside scoop on Mitt Romney, who's really behind him. Uh, also, what's happening in Greece being gobbled up. Uh, they're now announcing world government by the private banks. So the Ponzi scheme operators don't go to jail, unless they're Bernie Madoff, I guess, or Ken Lay. Uh, they actually take the planet over. And I want to ask him about some of these headlines. Israel working with terror group in Iran. Uh, U.S. working with al-Qaeda in Libya. Just amazing uh, to see the dreaded uh, enemy, uh, Al-Qaeda, working so closely with our loving governments like Israel, NATO, uh, and the United States. But without further ado, joining us uh, via video connection Skype is Greg Pallas. Greg, great to have you here with us. Happy Valentine's Day, guy. <laughs> now, I know you're always ferreting deeply into what's you know, really behind things. You exposed Bush, you exposed Obama. Now, what's going on with the golden boy uh, of the neocons, uh, Mr. Mitt Romney? Mr. Rit Mitt Romney, um, if you remember, he was the principal of Bain Capital, and everyone's just saying, oh, Bain Capital, uh, they're vulture capitalists. Well, but it's Bain Capital money that it's not his money that's in this race. Romney has an avalanche of money compared to the others, and no one seems to be asking, where did he get it? BBC Television asked me to get in and investigate and find out where his money's coming from. Under the guise of a of an operation super PAC called Restore Our Future, the number one donor 
for the Romney campaign, the guy who seems to be at the center of the whole thing, is a, is a guy named Paul the Vulture Singer. Now, I didn't name him the Vulture. Uh, you know, it, uh, he happens to be uh, one of the guys I'm targeting in my book, Vulture's Picnic. How did he get the name Vulture? His bankers gave him the name, and, and he loved it, though now I think he's trying to rebrand himself. You have to understand, he is a billionaire worth about, he's worth about $4 billion. He's teamed up with the Koch brothers, David and Charles. Uh, Singer put in a million dollar check into Restore Our Future, and he's given all kinds of other money. By the way, they don't even like Mitt Romney. Their first choice is Chris Christie. And, and by the way, they're maneuvering Romney into a loss. They're his supposed pack, but they're maneuvering him into a brokered convention where the billionaires can be brokers. Now, who is Singer and why does and why does he want a president? He doesn't care about Romney's politics. He couldn't uh, give a damn. He is, he is investing. He's investing in real estate, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, Paul the Vulture Singer made his first killing, as all vultures do. They wait for uh, corporations to die, countries to die, people to die. And uh, his first billion was made when he bought a company called Owens Corning. It made asbestos. These were basically death factories where their workers' lungs were being turned to mush because they're filling with asbestos. They got asbestosis, and then you, you die a horrible, slow, suffocating death. When it was discovered that the company had been doing this and knew about it, they went into bankruptcy, and their executives agreed to give all their future profits to their workers who were dying. Um, Paul Singer swooped in, the vulture, Singer the vulture swooped in, bought the company out of bankruptcy for peanuts, and I don't even think he included the shells. He bought Owens Corning for peanuts, and then he used his political influence with a guy named George W. Bush and others to change the rules so he wouldn't have to pay the asbestos workers, they had to take about 20 cents on the dollar. They lost about 80 cents. What happened to the 80 cents? It basically went into to Singer's pocket because the company didn't have to pay their dying workers anymore. And the dying workers accepted whatever they could take. They were dying. Um, they just took it. And he kept that 80 cents, which added up to over a billion dollars profit. So with an investment of next to nothing, using political influence, not, not smart investing, political influence, he made a billion dollars, this guy. Then he just then he went after the uh, uh, Peru. He went after the Congo. I just came back from the Congo, following this guy's money down uh, up the Congo River. That's where Mitt Romney's getting his money. The characters behind him are not investors. They're not wealth creators. They're vultures, and they make you know when they talk about Vain, uh, Bain Capital being a vulture company, they're Girl Scouts compared to the guys who are actually behind Romney. Well, when you see the entire establishment media left and right, giving the guy a pass. When you see the big neocon talk show host pretty much endorsing him, when you see all of this, it becomes clear he's who they want. And then you have the last head of Bain Capital, and of course, Romney's still highly invested in it with that so-called trust. Now you have uh, the last head of Bain Capital going to work for Obama to replace Daley. So it shows that uh, the people behind Romney are also those, to a certain extent, behind Obama, and many of the policies that they both support are the same. So this shows that the establishment basically wants to keep things uh, going in the same direction. And if you look at how Bain and others go in and buy up profitable companies, chop them all off, he calls that uh, wealth production, uh, what do you see, uh, what are the goals of the people that control uh, Mitt Romney. I mean, who are some of these individuals? And uh, when you say Bain is nothing compared to them, what type of folks are we talking about? And why do they like Mitt? Okay, well, actually, the Deputy Secretary of the UN, and you may not be crazy about the UN, but he's certainly a guy who's worried about people in Africa. Um, he, um, he said that people like, um, like Paul the Vulture Singer, that they are causing babies to die. I was just in the Congo where uh, uh, Singer and his buddies took the money that the United States had set aside to help the Congo stop a cholera e uh, epidemic to clean up their water supplies. They claimed that uh, some vultures claimed that they that the Congo owed them money. I traced this so-called debt back to Bosnia and a three million dollar illegal payment 
to the ex-prime minister of Bosnia, another country we, we pulled out with uh, NATO bombers, remember. And as uh, what happened was that we installed a prime minister who then took $3 million from one of these vultures and gave him the right to collect money from the Congo. It was all done illegally. The police in Bosnia have now said that that was an illegal transaction, trying to put their ex-prime minister in prison. This is the type of money that is backing the Romney campaign. Now, you have to wonder why. The answer is really simple. The, um, the European community, England, others are pressuring the U.S. government to make Paul Singer's activity illegal. It's illegal in a lot of the world. You, you know, this guy's made billions through these, through these really questionable methods, going after the asbestos workers, going after poor Congolese. He helped the president of Peru, a guy named Fujimori, escape the country ahead of murder charges, and that helped him put $58 million of Peruvian treasury money in his pocket. I've been following this guy around the world, quite creepy. He needs, he needs a president in office who will protect him, who will protect him because the other nations are asking the U.S. to shut down his operations. This is not investing. And I got to tell you that Paul the Vulture Singer, when I ran these reports, and don't forget, these reports are run at the top of the nightly news worldwide, except in the United States. You're, you're the exception, Alex, uh, allowing me to uh, report on uh, Romney's billionaires. And by the way, Obama's billionaires is too, you know, let's not forget. Well, well let's leave some time for those guys too. But uh, Romney's billionaire, uh, he had his goons call up my producers in London at BBC and say, we've got a file on Greg Pallast. Now, in the U.S., that would be the end of my career. But BBC said, well, Greg Pallast has a file on you. And that's you know, my book, Vulture's Picnic. I've been following these guys a long time. But you have to understand why, who these guys are behind Romney. And like I say, it's not so much that they're behind Romney. Their super PAC called Restore Our Future isn't about restoring your future, Alex, or mine, or Romney's. It's their future. In fact, what they're really hoping to do, don't forget, Paul the Vulture Singer, the Cokes, and his friends, Paulson, a multi-billionaire guy, made $4 million billion in one year helping crash the U.S. housing market. That's another guy behind uh, Romney, wrote a check for $1 million cash. Singer wrote a check for $1 million cash. Coke, half a million dollars cash. Then they pulled out their cash just before the Colorado, Missouri, and Minnesota caucuses, allowing Romney to lose. Let's not forget, he was allowed to lose by his super PAC. They didn't put in a dime. Why? They're not sure that they really want Romney. He's their second best choice. They want to control the Republican convention and name the guy that they want. And I don't think it's Romney. He's their second, he's their second choice. Well, I was about to bring that up. They've got even top Republican strategists uh, out there uh, running around now saying they could do a brokered convention. As you know, they changed the rules two years ago in 2010 to be able to do that. And they're now floating as the knight in shining armor, at least as VP, Jeb Bush. And I got to say it, I cannot stand Obama. He's run by some of the very same crew, but another Bush. I mean, this is becoming a hereditary dictatorship especially if they get a Bush in through a broker convention and not even running in a general primary. Well, I think they feel comfortable with Jeb Bush. I think they feel comfortable with Chris Christie. Um, and what they're mainly worried about is not even who these guys are. They're worried that, that Romney, Santorum, and Gingrich simply can't win. They need someone to scare Obama. By the way, they don't necessarily need to replace Obama, just scare him away from anything that might threaten them. Well, that's another These question I want to raise right here. I have yeah. no doubt that, that News Corp is involved in spying and corruption and tapping of phones. And uh, all of that has you know, come out and people have been admitting to it. And one guy, the main witness, mysteriously dies. I mean, all of this is going on. Now they're talking about investigations here, indictments here. But the Justice Department's got Fast and Furious going on. They've got their own uh, energy you know, company scams going on, paying off donors. And so it looks like the two sides are jockeying to basically blackmail each other. And I do see News Corp softening on Obama, 
with, uh, you know, some host saying Obama's a great guy now. But, but since you're over in England and in New York, kind of a guy in between, uh, tell us what the inside scoop is on what's going on with the whole uh, News Corps situation. Uh, I mean, how much fire is where that smoke's coming from, and how does it tie into Obama? Uh, ties in plenty because I did an undercover investigation of one of News Corps lobbyists. I wore a hidden wire and pretended that I was a lobbyist for Enron. <laughs> and so I was hooking up with News Corps lobbyists to hire them in. Uh, this, so I did that for the Observer newspaper of Britain. So I went inside. I, I spoke with uh, Murdoch's lobbyists working, and they're working both at that time. They're working, by the way, with the Clintons. They're working, um, and they're working with Tony Blair. What they said is, look, as long as these governments can lock up with media, that they are safe. That's the game. So their lobbyists basically offer a protection racket. And they even gave me very, very specific examples of stories that were placed to protect these people. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, like I say, I have these lobbyists on tape. These tapes were, by the way, broadcast on the BBC Nightly News. So I went inside. If you ever meet these guys and go inside, um, you'd be stunned at what they say about how they operate. I mean, it was just absolutely unbelievable saying, you know, that they that uh, they basically run stories past 10 Downing Street. They had direct contact with the White House. You know, what do these guys want? So when they feel like it, they, they shoot some bullets at the White House or 10 Downing and then uh, just to scare everyone. And then uh, they, they the, the tune is named. You know, there, there's all kinds of, uh, of back and forth politics here where someone's going to have to walk the plank. Maybe someone's trying to stab James Murdoch in the back from inside the organization, maybe even within the family. But, uh, you know, there, there are wider issues here. Um, I got to tell you that, you know, Piers Morgan is deeply involved in this stuff and, and uh, that drags in CNN. Well, and let me stop so you right far, there. Skip the bullet. Yeah. Greg, uh, I want you to expand on that because. I don't really ever toot my own horn here because I'm always busy. I'm, I'm obsessed with the story. I'm obsessed with the interesting guest. I'm obsessed with reality and really trying to learn reality for myself. I mean, this is an obsession, uh, a passion, an addiction. And I know for you it's the same because I've read your books, followed your work for more than a decade. I think that we forget how effective we've been, yourself particularly. I mean, I forget all the time I think back to all the things I've done, the stories I've broken. And then I was just thinking while you were talking about books you wrote six, seven years ago to, saying News Corps was spying and wielding authority. And, and I was just thinking, wait a minute, right. I haven't heard hardly anybody, well, I did see a few articles, giving you credit for being right about all this. And I've been right about so many things. I just think it's important we point out that you in 2002 got the IMF World Bank documents and said, how they've imploded Argentina and third world countries, they're gonna do that in Europe and the US. They're gonna use derivatives. They're gonna take over. They're gonna occupy the countries. Boom, it's all happened. I mean, I'm just sitting here, not in some mutual admiration society. It's kind of freaking me out because I don't have that high view of myself. You know, I'm like, I'm just a regular guy just trying to find out what's happening. Uh, you're an investigative reporter. I have high views of you. I mean, my point is, it is creepy to know there's not many of us that actually know what's going on or that have any type of venue, and I'm getting threats, I'm on enemy's list, they're calling you up saying we got files on you, it's creepy. And, and I've digressed off here, but I think it's newsworthy that, that we always are just moving forward, never pointing out where we were right in the past. So spend a few minutes and then get back into CNN, uh, because I remember uh, having you on, you having the documents, you talking about news corps, a mafia, and I remember going, well, I believe Greg, and yeah, he's got some proof, but, and then, and then their outlets demonizing you and calling you a liar and, you know, cover stories. I mean, that's all actually in Vulture's Picnic that came out even before this scandal broke. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you better get some good life insurance. I, I know I have, and none of us are ever going to commit suicide, right, Greg? Never. If, if I'm floating face down the swimming pool, please don't uh, believe any note that says I was I felt terrible and had to go. Don't <laughs> buy it, please. OK, I'm, I'm putting that down on, on the record right now. Me too. I, I 
<laughs> I've never held a, a knife to my own throat ever. So, you know, so please, uh, I want to put that right on the record. I'm glad we got a moment to do that. As in terms of, of getting of saying, yeah, I told you so. I think it is worthwhile because it gives credibility to the material that we did put on before. I should note that I, I'm a lucky guy in one way. You might not see me on US TV except uh, you know, bless you, Alex, especially on Valentine's Day, then kiss you. Uh, <laughs> um, but let, um, but I do have the world's largest news network behind me, putting me on a prime time BBC television. Now, do understand that BBC, when I got the documents from inside the IMF, and now we do see Greece on fire. There's a, a chapter in Vulture's Picnic called the generalism of globalization, where I actually have these documents from inside the IMF World Bank. And because of my position in journalism in Europe, I was actually able to confront personally the um, director general of the World Trade Organization and put these inside confidential documents and cables in front of him. That was his opportunity to say, oh, it's all made up. It's a bunch of conspiracy junk. He verified everything. He tried to talk away their meaning, but he verified everything that I had, all the documents I had. When you see Greece on fire, I saw those documents. I also spoke to the inventor of the euro, um, Bob Mundell, and who said, you know, basically is saying this was in the plan. The idea was to, he wanted to end, uh, he wanted to make sure that there was a sell-off of all the government properties in Greece, etc. You have to set a fire if you're going to have a fire sale. He thought that this is the best thing that's ever happened. These guys, this was the purpose of the euro. He said, he was very upset, he told me, that, that uh, democracies... Uh, get to kind of vote on their fiscal and monetary, have fiscal and monetary control. He wanted to create a mechanism, the euro, which would be, uh, which would make uh, elected parliaments and congresses and presidents subservient to an economic formula. And the economic formula is called the um, is called the three percent rule. There, it's a there's a German word which I can't pronounce that they use, uh, but that was the purpose was to basically create something that would replace that would replace democracy. In fact, by the way, I spoke with you know I, because again because of my position, I get to meet all these heads of state, etc. And I've met with Carlo Monti, the new um, the new prime minister uh, of uh, of Italy, the new chief of Italy, and uh, Monti, um, you know, has not been elected. He's just a banker. That's, you know, you don't get to choose anymore. They call the him a technocrat. I mean, even The Economist says it's good to not have countries run themselves. We, the technocrats, will run it now. And as you said years ago when you got to meet, you know, with the head of the organization, the World Trade Organization, they admitted this is how we were going to take over. But then it's they're the ones that sold the fraudulent debt and got the governments to sign on. They're the ones that actually have most of the debt. And so they do this Fingali judo move where they're set up as our bosses, even though they're the progenitors of it. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Well, in fact, in, in the case of like uh, uh, Greece, I call it a crime scene. In particular, the Greek government, to stay within the euro, both the so-called socialists and the so-called conservatives there, um, had cut a private deal with Goldman Sachs to hide... Uh, to hide their true deficits. And this was true of most of the countries, but this was particularly done with Goldman Sachs and had to do with, with trading euros into yen and dollars and back. Uh, technically, on paper, it looked like Goldman Sachs took a multi-billion dollar loss. Well, Goldman Sachs never takes a deliberate multi-million billion dollar loss. That's nonsense. In fact, it was covered up by a secret agreement to pay them back at massive charges, uh, with massive uh, usurious charges. I mean, you couldn't call it anything uh, anything else. Plus a half billion dollar fee on top of the massive interest rates that they were collecting, all done in secret. When this came out, of course, then the Greek uh, bond market, the market for Greek bonds, completely collapsed, and people rightly, in a way, asked for massive, massively high interest because, you know, they say we're, we're victims of a fraud. Now, why, um, you know, someone asked me, actually, uh, 
uh, actually one of the me band members from, if you remember, Dire Straits, uh, uh, asked, yeah, well, how, come, how come they weren't arrested? Well, you, the United States, what, the Securities Exchange Commission is supposed to uh, arrest the, uh, the government of Greece? Because after all, it was a conspiracy between two governments and Goldman Sachs. And here's the deal. Instead of Goldman being busted, they get, they get money from the European Central Bank. They get totally bailed out. They get fees for handling the bailout. And then their guys take over the country and they buy up the assets of the country, the shipping, the beaches, uh, you know, the, 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 the islands. Sites. I've seen cases yeah. in, in the news where they owe a, a brokerage firm that sold them crap $3 billion. So the head of the company goes, I'll take an island personally for $3 billion. I mean, and it's all through fraud. So I guess Madoff's problem and Ken Lay's problem was the frauds weren't big enough and weren't so giant that it'd bring down the whole system. Here's my question for you, and then I want to go back to the news court thing because people say, hey, you cut him off when you got to the part about CNN. Where is it all headed now with MF Global, where, as you know, the head of the commodities board was the former minion of Corzine. Corzine gets caught in Congress lying. Of course, he ordered the now 1.6 billion uh, transferred to London. And then he doesn't get in trouble. And I was talking to Max Kaiser today. He, he said, look, this is just going to signal a new level of stealing going after segregated accounts. So A, where is it all headed? And then B, going back, what is News Corp from your deep research and understanding? What is it? A, more of a mafia organization? And then tie it in to uh, the uh, host that took over Larry King's slot uh, that you were trying to get to when I interrupted. Okay, uh, that, that's quite a tall order. First, Corzine, who was governor of New Jersey, but he was also, you have to understand, he was the CEO of Goldman Sachs before he became governor of New Jersey. Now, uh, why don't they go after Corzine? Why hasn't he read his rights? I mean, if you shoplift, you know, if you shoplift a screwdriver from a hardware store, they're gonna they're gonna read you your rights. You shoplift 1.6 billion dollars, and and um, they invite you to Congress to just uh, give a chat. Why? What the answer is? What he has on these guys, and who else is in on this stuff? Now, I got a glimpse of it. I can't get it all, you know, because I just don't have all of the roots in. But I did have a document. Mark Confidential from Tim Geithner, who is our Secretary of Treasury, to Larry Summers. It's in the book Vultures Picnic. In fact, you can see it at the, my site, vulturespicnic.org. Um, it was a cable written by Geithner to Summers talking about how they were going to use the World Trade Organization to squeeze any nation that got in the way of our banks and didn't join in the deregulation um, uh, fest uh, that was going on. So they were how they're going to punish nations, in particular Brazil. Now, why is that important? That this discussion. The answer is that Geithner told Summers, who was um, at that time Secretary of Treasury, now uh, uh, until recently was Obama's uh, economic czar. Why did Geithner, our now Secretary of Treasury, write to Summers? He was telling him to call the top five bankers in America before they pulled the trigger at the World Trade Organization because it could bring down and did bring down the world financial order. But he didn't want to do that unless he said, call these guys. John Corzine was one of the five guys to call. And by the way, the memo I have in print in the book are their private and personal numbers. And the first, one of the first reviewers of the book before it was published decided, oh, what the heck, I'll call the numbers and see. And he, and he, got, the, uh, he got right through personally uh, to the CEO of Citibank, <laughs> right into his office. Uh, obviously, those numbers have changed. But the important thing is these guys, our leaders, Secretary of Treasury, do not pee unless they contact Goldman, it was Bank of America, Citibank, Morgan. Those are the guys running the show. And if they were to ever try to nail Corzine, Madoff is just a sideshow. But if they're ever to try to nail Corzine, he could pull out his files and say, well, let's talk about some of the meetings we had. So, we so had here's Clinton, my question. Right. What do you do when there's five or six mega bank dons? who've gotten so untouchable because they know where all the bodies are buried that they start publicly just stealing cash straight, straight out of people's accounts. I mean, that's corruption getting to that terminal model 
where, you know, that historians talk about where nobody can blow the whistle on anybody else. And so things just rapidly disintegrate. Are we starting to reach the disintegration point or does it have a, a decade more of just deepening Caligula type mania? Uh, well, I'm, the good thing is that America is at its core a very rich nation. And there's rich pickings. As I said, one of their big targets was Brazil, which is fabulously rich. Another target of Paul the Vulture Singer is the Congo. He's been seizing uh, money for shipments of cobalt and oil. So there's a lot of resource out there in this planet. And there's an unending appetite of the Chinese to, to take it. So if they can get their hands on our resources, by owning all our debt and controlling it, manipulating it. You know, it's amazing how much Americans will accept paying. Two million foreclosures a year, massive stealing uh, by Corzine, by Goldman. You saw the fraud in Greece. People in Greece are burning down buildings, but you know, Americans are shrugging their shoulders. Um, you know, it's um, it's amazing the amount of, of punishment the American people will take. So I think that there's quite a while yet before, because there's a lot of money still to, to steal out of the, you know, a lot of gold to... to uh, sure, there is. But I mean, Greg, mine. you live here, I live here, but you go all over the world more than probably anybody I know. I'm seeing the oxygen leave the room. I mean, I'm seeing family, everybody I know, even people that have been upper middle class, well-to-do, I mean, there's, there, there's money problems. Stuff costs a lot more, and, and we've been somewhat isolated from the rest of the world, but it's going to accelerate. Even Forbes is saying we're probably going to see 30-plus percent inflation in just the next year, and uh, I think it's the old story of the sleeping giant. I, uh, but, 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 but that's even scarier because it's going to get so much worse before they finally wake up. And then you've got Obama signing the NDAA, the Republicans supporting it, uh, they're admittedly training the military for urban warfare and domestic unrest. I mean, it's pretty scary. Well, you know, let's face it. When you and I talked back in 2002, nine years ago, when I first got my hands on the INF, IMF and World Bank documents, they'd gone after they'd burnt uh, Argentina to the ground. You had uh, you had professors uh, hunting through garbage cans looking for food. Brazil had basically become a financial colony, and they were squeezing it dry. Ecuador had lost all its oil and was basically um, you know a duchy of, of Chevron. So what's happened? But then those nations came back. People went into the streets in those nations. They said, that, you know, uh, uh, Occidental Petroleum, Al Gore's uh, little operation got tossed out of Ecuador. Brazil told the IMF to go to hell. The only nation in the entire planet which has refused to sign the financial services agreement, opening up their banking sector to, uh, to the derivatives uh, uh, toxic salesmen. Uh, Argentina told these characters to go fly. Those economies are now just really zooming. So people do react. However, I, we did say this is going to cross over to Europe. Europe is gloating that they've been able to pick up resources out of Latin America for nothing. No, you said that in 2002 on my show. The transcript of it is a chapter in my book that's out of print, Sent to Tyranny, but it's posted here at PrisonPlanet.tv. We've only got about 10 minutes left with you. You've been very gracious uh, of joining us here this evening, Greg. I'll get you back on the radio soon. Uh, and it's all in Vulture's Picnic, available at Amazon, bookstores everywhere. In fact, I was just at Barnes & Noble last week and picked up another copy for family. They had a big end cap of them there, so that must be selling quite well if it's at, you know, at the end cap at Barnes & Noble. Uh, so people are hungry for the truth. But I want to go back, because I interrupted running off into a side issue. Let's go back to News Corps. What is News Corps at its heart? Because you were the first I've ever seen saying all this. I'm like, really, Greg? It's kind of a... Creepy group, influence peddling, spying on people, telling Downing Street what to do. Now it's all come out. Hiring police, spying on people, everything you said. And it's actually in your book. Funny it came out or was being written right as this broke. You know how they were saying you were full of it uh, earlier. Uh, but now, now it's come out. Uh, I mean, who are they really? And then you were getting off into CNN. The fact that this isn't yeah, just, uh, you know, uh, News Corps now. You bet. It's the whole crew. But I, like I say, I went in wearing a wire uh, using a false front operation uh, for the Observer and then later BBC joined in where we did secret recording of Murdoch's lobbyists. And they laid the whole thing out. They don't see themselves as a media company. They see themselves as a political information organization. 
In other words, there, in other words, to make their money, media, like you, know, you can't just make money by opening a radio or TV station or or a uh, web outlet. Uh, you know how difficult that is if you really have to compete on the merits. This is all about buying and selling spectrum, buying and selling control of airwaves. And so for Murdoch, everything, for News Corp, everything is about their political connection, their ability to lock things up and lock others out. And so the lobbyists were explaining that basically they are the conduit for a business elite in, and secondarily the political elite so that they're not so much for or against a particular candidate. And you notice that Murdoch will switch back and forth on who he backs. Sure, he's influence he's peddling. Them. So, you know, it's basically up for the highest bidder. What does he want? Very concerned about getting the China and Southeast Asia market right now. And they need the political help of the uh, European governments and the U.S. government. So that's that's Murdoch and News Corp. Then you have at the same time, time uh, you have Time Warner, CNN. And what uh, Piers Morgan was uh, one of the people when I remember when I went undercover, the first thing that they had to do was discredit me. So Piers Morgan, who was in this operation, he was editor of uh, the the Daily Mail, uh, the one of the uh, one of the tabloid papers there, and Morgan uh, basically set up a deal where uh, I he. Well, to put it this way, I was trying to get more information going undercover. I was wearing a wire. And I thought, well, one way to, to get some information is there was a very uh, fair, fairly good looking woman, quite good looking woman who was very close to Tony Blair, a rising young political star. And I thought that I could get some information from her probably uh, easier if we had less clothes on. That wouldn't have been so bad, except that her husband walked in and I could have dealt with that. But the main thing was that Piers Morgan had set this up so that his photographer came in and they used that to try to discredit me by you know so I was all over the front page and again you're working British hard paper. for the story I mean we <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you know okay but the, by the way I got the story and that's what they didn't like and the story by the way involved Enron it involved the big power company southern company of the U.S. it involved these huge power companies uh, that were basically uh, buying up influence and News Corp. In News Corp, um, Entergy, which is very, very close to the Clintons, okay? So there's Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, and Entergy Corporation. There was Enron, which is the Bushes. There was News Corp. I was getting this information and how Blair was basically, Tony Blair was selling out his government. And of course, I'm getting the information about the U.S. government because it involves the Clintons and Entergy. This little Little Rock company, by the way, a tiny company from Little Rock was given ownership of London Electricity, if you can imagine this gigantic operation. Then they flip it to the French, to Electricité de France, after holding it a couple months and make $2 billion, right? So $2 billion is made out of thin air, really close friends of the Clintons, right? This is how it all works. So I'm getting this information, and yeah, okay, so my zipper was down, so they caught me with my pants off. Yeah, okay, but you know what? They can discredit me, but they couldn't discredit the evidence. And it is to the great, um, you know, uh, great thanks to um, the Guardian and BBC that they didn't care, <laughs> that they didn't care whether my pants are up or down. The important thing is that the information I had was rock solid. Yeah, what matters and is that is that was a story. What matters is is that it was true what you were saying, and it's certainly all been borne out. Now you. Uh, I tell you, this is incredible information, Greg. I'm going to air part of this uh, on the radio tomorrow. In fact, the last 15 minutes has, I think, been some of the best TV slash radio we've ever done. Just amazing information. That's the kind of stuff that people will find in this book, Vultures Picnic, and they certainly are vultures. Uh, shifting gears now to the last question. We see Hillary saying it's a new peace war. We need to invade Syria with peacekeepers, peace bombs for Libya. I'm no fan of Gaddafi. I'm no fan of Assad. I'm no fan of Mubarak. But they're replacing them with Muslim Brotherhood. They're torturing the ambassador to France. They're killing thousands of black people. They're lining folks up and shooting them. The real humanitarian disaster has now happened. AFRICON is admitting they're invading Africa through there. I want to get your perspective, but this is what I've seen. And, and now we're being lectured, and I'm seeing the CIA operative, uh, Anderson Cooper, 
with this young guy up there one night going, they are killing us 40,000 today. Next day, he's got a perfect English accent. He, I mean, the, the, their actor is so bad, you know, on these shows, he can't even get that straight. So the whole thing is obviously a baby uh, thrown out of the incubator story. And again, not a fan of Assad, but they admit Al-Qaeda is the main group in Libya. They're shipping Al-Qaeda into Syria. I thought I had to let the TSA stick their hands down my pants and my wife's pants because Al-Qaeda was going to get me and was hiding under every table. But, but, but now Al-Qaeda, I'm being told, are some good people. So I'm confused. What's going on here? Uh, would you believe it? It's about the oil. And what's happening, Syria doesn't have oil per se, but this is about control by Saudi Arabia over a, a Shia land, the Syria and Assad. Assad is an Alawite, which is a, a, a sect which is split off from the Shia, which are absolutely hated and despised by the Saudis. So he's a minority of a minority of the most hated right. group by the Wahhabist. Right. And so what they want to do, they, they see an opportunity. Now, of course, well, I agree with you. Assad is an absolute fanatic murderer. But you notice that when he killed 10,000 of his own people in the city of Hamas, we just, you know, whistled. We didn't care about that. It's just that now the Saudis have said, the, now that the Saudis are out to get him, suddenly we're concerned. And that disturbs me. I, again, Assad is a murderer. When his dad killed those 10,000 innocent people and we said nothing it made me sick and to see his the son now uh, repeat the same trick it also makes me sick but what but then what makes me sicker in some way is to say well we're finally going to say something about it maybe do something about it because the saudis don't want him there and part of it is religious but also part of it is a showdown with iran over control of opec and, and the control of the Shia Crescent. Remember that Saudi Arabia moved into Bahrain. I realize it's a little complex, but Bahrain was facing a, an uprising by a Shia majority against a Sunni um, a monarchy backed by the Saudis. The Saudis cannot afford to have Shia-controlled nations as it, or they're going to lose control of the oil routes. Exactly. Our media acts like all the Arabs want to kill Christians and Jews when it's an incredibly diverse group and they're busy with their own empires hating and killing each other much more than they supposedly hate the West. From my meager research, you've done more and been over there a lot more. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, their battles are internal within within the Islamic religion, huge internal battles, which which also obviously go to resources. And you see this split in places that you haven't heard of. But wait till the 101st Airborne gets there. I was just in in Vulture's Picnic. I was in Baku, Azerbaijan, which is one of those new Repu uh, Islamic republics. I call it the Islamic Republic of BP. And we're going to end up there. Once again, you've got the problem where you have a uh, um, a Sunni dictator uh, who was the old KGB chief, right? He went from being a good communist to being a good Muslim, right? And the reason why he's a good Muslim in our, in our view, and now he's our great ally, is that he's given a contract to BP Amico, which is now one company, by the okay, way. Okay, so let me ask you this question then in closing. Where is it all going? Uh, should we just step back and let them all kill each other? Uh, what would then happen in the West? Obviously, we pay for the empire, really don't get many of the goods, just being honest about it. And how does somebody like Ron Paul, in your view, tie in with the demonization, the clear election fraud, the system coming after him? I haven't asked Greg Palace his view on Ron Paul. Well, the, the main thing is what's going to happen now in these Islamic republics. In the case of Assad, it's horrible to have him stay there and murder his people. What I do worry about is bringing in the, the dark night of Wahhabism as the alternative. I just spoke to one of my, uh, a, a friend of mine who is uh, an Arabic speaker. He's Arabic. He, um, and he earned his PhD on the Muslim Brotherhood. And he said Egypt is going to devolve into another uh, uh, kind of Iran light. Yes, we do have problems. We were paying, as you said, with Al Qaeda, we were paying the Taliban to allow shipments across uh, Afghanistan. We, you know, the, the real politique of the Mideast is getting more and more complex, slick with oil. And now we're adding, by the way, uranium 
in Islamic nations like Niger. So it's a multi-level chessboard. I can't say I understand all the pieces. I obviously, as an investigative reporter, I've been going to these places and getting inside as much as I can to try to understand it. But obviously, it's not as simple as Assad, the bad guy, who was a good guy last week. He, look, we went through this. Saddam was our ally when he was murdering people left and well, right. Well, here's what I'm saying. Obviously, the West isn't going in there to put a democracy in and obviously you're going to end up having a the Wahhabis in a big war with the Shiites now in Syria and it'll be 10 times the deaths I mean look what Libya's turned into I'm very concerned that what we are doing is igniting for the purposes of Saudi control of the area that we're igniting in an intra-Islamic war. And maybe some people think that's good. Go let them kill each other. You know what? That ain't going to be good for us. That's not going to be good for this planet. If there is a continuing massive war that's within Islam, fomented by war over oil and uranium and now rare earth like cobalt and, and other rare earth minerals, which are now becoming another major source of contention in places like Africa. Afghanistan. Right. Very, very concerned about this. All right. Well, incredible interview. Greg Pallas, thank you so much for the time. GregPallas.com, the book Vulture's Picnic. And uh, I know we were late getting you on, so I'm going to sign off with you now. Thank you so much for the time, Greg. You're the best, Alex, really. Thanks. Thank you, sir. All right. Amazing, in depth, uh, candid, teleprompter free, no script, real information. That's Greg Pallas. Please thank him for joining us. Okay. In closing, uh, folks, this is real TV. This is real radio. When I rebroadcast this tomorrow on the radio, uh, this is what it's all about. And it is imperative that all of you out there continue to spread the word about this broadcast. We are seeing massive censorship increasing everywhere. The governments everywhere are saying they're going to start censoring alternative media because we're becoming the media. We're, 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 we're displacing the traitor media. It's happening. That they're going to use all sorts of tricks. Uh, I'm telling you, the attack is now on. It's going to intensify. The wars are starting. The conflicts are accelerating. The covert war in Iran is in full swing. The proxy war against Syria is in full swing. We're going to pay for it, which would be bad enough if our government was just an empire but gave us some of the spoils. We pay for this, and we get the bad name, we get the hatred of the world, and the globalists are setting up police states here domestically, attacking our families, destroying our local control. This new world order is bad for everybody. I talk to so many good old boys, you know, people that are well-to-do, business and things, and they go, Alex, maybe it was an inside job. You got to do tough stuff to keep America strong, fighting the Muslims, or Alex, you know, we've got to be involved in all this corruption. That's just how the world works. We're not involved unless we acquiesce to it. But you guys that think this corruption is getting us somewhere, it's not. We're paying for it and getting all the blame. And now the whole Constitution's being shredded. For heaven's sakes, the, the, the globalists hate us more than they hate the Muslims. You, they hate the Muslims because they're free and wild and not under globalist complete control. Saudi Arabia is hooked up with British intel, so it's a little precious. So they've got to be brought under heel. they got to be vaccinated. they got to have MTV pumped in to screw up their families. They've got to be social engineered. And the American people, we're even more hated. If you think the New World Order technocrats, the Rothschilds and people and Rockefellers, if you think they hate the Muslims and people like the Shiites, if you think they hate them, I want to see Muslims kill each other. Folks, they really hate us, okay? And I'm talking to, you know, Anglo-Saxon, white Protestant males, uh, black people, Hispanic, Asian. You're an American. You live here. You've got this birthright of more freedom than other countries. You know, our, our corporate whore media spends all day saying how America isn't perfect and digging up all the bad things in our past. Compare it to other countries. I have. It's good compared to other ones. There's a reason they attack the Bill of Rights and Constitution everywhere and want to get rid of it, because it's a good Constitution compared to everything else out there. It's, it's well thought out. It doesn't mean it's ever been fully implemented, but the globalists are scared of it, saying, why don't you just get rid of that? We'll give you something new because they want to get rid of it. I'm ranting here. It's just this is a big deal. 
And when you do support us, more than just having a PrisonPlanet.tv membership, we got 15-day free trial running right now, uh, or getting 40-something uh, percent off when you purchase a year membership. Yeah, that funds keeping the lights on, the crew, the material. But, but more important than just that, when you're watching this free, after members have paid for it, which is part of our plan, millions of people a week online, on all the different video systems, millions a week just on YouTube, Please pay it forward. Email it to your email list, your Facebook, your Twitter, if you still got MySpace. Tell folks at work about it. That's how Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.com are growing exponentially in the face of censorship and all other sorts of garbage that's going on. Because here's my only big fear, okay? Every day I kick myself when I get off air that I haven't done a good enough job, that I, that I have this incredible platform and responsibility, and I've not really articulated what I understand mentally, intellectually, historically, to a proper level, that if I could just show you what I've researched, which we do do here in part, that you would understand. I know most of you are hardcore viewers do understand, but we've got to make other people understand. We're not telling them what to think. We're just showing them what's going on. We're just getting them to take the blinders off. You know, like a horse with blinders, take the blinders off. Get outside the box. Stop looking down here. Let me have a document cam shot, please. Stop looking down here like this little box is the entire world. And this is what New World Order Television is telling you to watch. This is not the whole world. This is not the whole universe. The magic of creativity and discovery, the wonderment, that is the universe. That is what being alive is. That is the great journey of discovery. The fascination. That's what it is to truly be illuminated. And people are like, whoa, he just said illuminated. That's Illuminati. The Illuminati have counterfeits of everything real. Light in the darkness. You know, the Bible's all about Christ bringing light. Oh, that's Illuminati. No, it's not. The Illuminati claims they're bringing light, but they're bringing a twisted, dark, black sunshine that is not the real light. And, and look, some people say, oh, I don't want to hear your religious stuff. Whatever. The globalists are religious. They believe in Lucifer. I've studied what they really believe. They know there's a spiritual realm. They know what we see and sense is a tiny band of the overall wavelength. Even the light we see is a tiny piece of the band. Do you understand that? A tiny piece of the band. There's so much more. The band isn't just like this. The band isn't just like this. And it's in all directions. You understand? It's, it's interdimensional. I mean, we are only a tiny expression of something larger. And you can feel it. You know it's there. Put whatever definition you want on it. These people don't want you to have that. I want you to have consciousness. I know you have consciousness. I want to see like a seed grow. I want to grow and awaken and learn and be a good person. And being a good person means I want to be aggressive and strong and stomp evil. Whoever sold you on the idea that being good is some little weak coward in the corner, that's not true. The globalists poison our food, our water, our psyche through the culture because they know we're powerful. You understand that? All of us as humans, not just as Americans, have a birthright of true liberty and freedom. But you got to demand it, you got to fight for it. And that isn't some heavy burden. That isn't some heavy burden. That is what life is all about. That's the challenge, the struggle. Freedom isn't free, it never is. And like racehorses that love to run so much, they'll, sh they'll rupture their hearts, their hearts will explode. That's what I feel like. Do people say, oh, you work so hard, we appreciate you. No, no, this is not work. This is what I was made to do. And this is what you were made to do. So my only fear is that I won't live to my potential. My only fear is that I won't articulate you know, truly the spirit of what I'm trying to say to you. My only fear is that I won't connect with you and that you won't fully awaken and that you won't fully awaken others. That's why I get so angry at the globalists putting little kids on Ritalin and Prozac that they know is meant to brain damage them, the fluoride meant to brain damage us all, and lower our IQ. We think we're smart now. Imagine what we'd be without it. And all their white papers, how they did it to us on purpose. That's the ultimate sin. That's the attack on free will. That's the attempt to fog us and, and bludgeon us and give us chemical lobotomies so that we can never grow into something great. 
To do that to humanity while claiming you're trying to build them up as the globalists do is the ultimate sin. It is taking little innocence in the magicness of children. And, and children are magic to us because we're designed at that phase in our life to want to teach them, to want to raise them up, to want to make them honorable, just as our ancestors did for us. And so I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm obnoxious. I know I interrupt people because I don't want to make a point and impress people. I, I'm desperate like a volcano to explode and to say, yes, you're right. And here, here, you know, like, like in a black church service, we're like, I, I heard that. Say it again. I mean, that's what this is all about here, ladies and gentlemen. It's real. It's real. You're not going to find fulfillment. I know I didn't in partying and in sex and in uh, street fights. You're not going to find it in, in the world, okay? That, the world and the flesh is part of who we are. You're only going to find fulfillment in discovering truth. And I'm not going to tell you what the perfect definition of the truth is because I don't know. But it's the seeking after the truth. It's, it's reaching for what makes humans magical. It's reaching for the part that we know is there that is in the stars, Instead of just saying, we're ugly, we're scum, we don't have any value, we're crap, and this culture I see of just getting in to being mediocre and ugly and stinking, then it doesn't mean I can't look into the darkness and understand the appeal of that. I get it. The point is we're way out of balance, ladies and gentlemen, and the globalists are out of balance, and they're going to end up destroying themselves as well. So it's time to reach towards destiny. Martin Luther King said that the universe bends towards justice. And it's true. There is providence that George Washington talked about. You can call it whatever it is. When you dedicate your will and your time to something instead of feeling small, when you realize you can defeat the new world order, there are so many people I interview who are good men and women who still th think we can't beat the new world order and don't have any confidence in themselves. The globalists are smart people who've joined evil and decided to hurt others and keep others in the dark. They have will. That's why they're in control. When you have knowledge and then you have will and then you have right purpose, moral authority, when it is directed by good, trumps. It's the ace of spades. Evil every time. It trumps it hard, bone crushing, like a trillion pounds dropped on a cockroach. That's why I say I don't even feel worthy to be here at the tip of the spear ramming into the new world order. People say, well, why are you still alive? Because God's hand is on me. And whatever little definition we've got can't describe what that is. It's destiny. The universe is in control, not these New World Order people. When you join the will of the universe, when you join that, you're unstoppable. You can feel it right now. Come in, join it. They say, knock, you got to open the door. Evil has to get you to let it in, too. The old parable of the vampire. It has to get you to let it in. It has to get you to acquiesce. You understand that? That's a law of the universe. The decision is yours. That's it for this edition of InfoWars Nightly News. I'm Alex Jones.